I'm going to read you the shortest chapter of my book. Yay! Um, and, but I'll set it up a little bit. Uh, it's Miles from Nowhere, and it's about a Korean-American teen runaway. Um, the book takes place in 1980s New York, and her name is June. I don't think she's mentioned. Her name isn't, isn't mentioned in this section, but um, she leaves home for good when she's 13. Um, she leaves behind a, a sort of a fractured family, a, a mom and a father, and. She, the section that I'm going to read from you tonight, she uh, has been away. She's been on the streets for about three years, and she's starting to kind of miss the mother that she's left behind. And so that's that's all you need to know. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Because I read kind of quite. I get a little nervous, and then I read kind of. See, just ignore the nervous part. Um, but this section is called "With a Boy." <clears throat> I lived on the sixth floor of an abandoned building with a boy who worked like me. Blue fly with his sunny hair and pool blue eyes sold himself mostly. He stayed away for days, one time a whole week, and he almost always came back with money and a boil somewhere on his body. When he wasn't hooking or shooting heroin, he snuck clothes out of laundromats and sold them on sidewalks miles away with a cardboard poster that said, Garage Sale, Moving to Alaska. He stole everything, all the time, and the closer we got, the more he stole from me. He had a thing for keys, and my money. But being with him was easy, and once in a while we loved each other, as if God himself had taught us how. But then the accident happened. He was on the floor cooking his spoon over the sterno can, and I was mad because he'd said there was only enough for him, that half would do neither of us any good. He tapped his favorite vein, the one he called the Great Wall of China, and I kicked the sterno out from under him. He should have moved, most people would have, but he was so focused on his arm, so stubborn about rolling his eyes backwards and falling into the rush. He didn't care about the small fire clinging to his leg. His back sloped against the wall. His eyes turned to worms. I stood there watching him nodding and half swatting his calf before realizing that maybe I should help. <clears throat> At the hospital, under the white lights and in front of a pretty nurse with tired eyes, blue fly spit in my face. His leg was wet bandaged and slung up by the ankle, and the nurse was touching his knee in a way I didn't much like. Then Blue called me a useless, stupid cunt. I was relieved that he was finally talking to me, but instead of saying that, I punched him in the stomach and called him a faggot junkie. You sell your asshole, I screamed, which made the nurse hold her hands up at me. That's it. Visiting hours over, she said, pushing me out the door. I told her she should hold on to her keys. In the hallway, I walked past the line of beds lumped with sick people, their gowns too thin to hide their fears. I wasn't bothered by the honesty of it all. My mom worked as a midnight nurse at a very busy hospital. Once when I was young, I asked her what she did for a living. She told me she saved people she didn't care about. <clears throat> that night, I slept on the train until a cop poked me with a stick. I got up, said sorry to his baton, and switched trains, then switched again until it finally turned morning. At rush hour, I started work as usual. Me, I didn't sell myself. I sold newspapers. Not like a paper route where you hopped on your bike at six in the morning, but like fishing out pages from the trash can and selling them on the trains when Metro cops weren't looking. The key was to screen the pages good, make sure there weren't any coffee blots or footprints. It was a job. I didn't beg. Panhandling was for losers. 
on good days, I'd make eight or ten bucks, and sometimes people handed money over without even taking a page, maybe thinking their donation would keep their kids from turning out like me. After picking through a few bins, I stepped into a packed car. The morning was hot and gluey, and people on the train looked to be heading to a funeral, their heads too heavy for their shoulders. Even the air felt thicker, harder to swallow. I held up a page and squeezed between sweating bodies, my elbow rubbing against the backs of business suits, selling news about Mark David Chapman's sentencing. Gets 20 years to life, I yelled over the train noise. No one looked up. Reads Catcher in the Rye in court, I said, tapping the page, but still nobody heard me. A chill spread up my neck and behind my ears, making me salivate. My stomach cramped. I hadn't had a hit in two days, if you don't count shooting up water, and my body felt invaded by electric eels. Looking for more space, I moved to the back. Love pulled a trigger, I said, under my breath, suddenly wanting to give up everything I'd ever known for an empty seat or to see blue. In my head, I spelled out his name over and over, but then wasn't sure if I'd been talking out loud. The car smelled of cooked cheese. The weight of others kept me standing as I closed my eyes and imagined giant hands wringing my body clean. It had been a while since I'd taken a day off. I thought about playing hooky, maybe taking a trip out to the ocean. I could take the train there and ride like a regular passenger, like everybody else, except I'd smile at people and pretend I was their summer sun. I threw up in the station bathroom. It splattered everywhere, some of it hitting the toilet water and splashing back onto my face. I rinsed off in one of those sinks that had a single faucet you pushed to get water, making it impossible to wash your face using both hands. With my shirt sleeve, I wiped off a mirror tagged with so much graffiti, I couldn't see any of me. Later that day, while working near the token booth, I saw them, the nurse from the hospital with Blue Fly. They passed me and didn't even notice. She had her arm around him, and even though they were a few people ahead of me, I could tell he wasn't limping anymore. The bitch nurse had healed his leg already. I couldn't stand the thought of Blue going to this woman's home. All this time, I thought he only did men old, ugly men with warts on their fingers. But now I saw he'd been cheating on me all along. From her, he'd get money, food, new clothes, and who knew what else? Maybe even a car. She probably had a pool. Under the exit sign, she stopped to run her fingers through his hair, just above the back of his neck. That's when I decided to follow them. Outside, the sun was so bright you couldn't even see it, and the heat dried the blood in my veins, making me, making me want to dig them out with my fingernails. But I was freezing too. I hugged myself and sweated and followed them anyway, down a busy street dotted with garbage bags, a quieter street bouncing with a game of stickball, a block of skinny houses, a row of hedges, then into a short driveway lined with potted plants. And it wasn't until I found a safe spot behind a tree in her backyard that I realized that the boy wasn't blue. He was actually someone I'd never seen in my life. His hair wasn't even blonde. Through the sliding glass doors, I watched the nurse talking to this boy, who I now guessed was her son although she looked too young to be his mother. They talked for a while as she opened and closed the refrigerator door, setting food on the counter. I imagined their conversation to be very boring. Then for no good reason, the boy came outside. 
I ducked down behind the tree. Hello? His voice came closer. Who's there? Closing my eyes seemed like the thing to do. Hello? He said again, and I made myself smaller, squeezing my eyes tighter. I'm standing right in front of you, you know. A tall, skinny boy, who wasn't more than 12, stood in front of me all right, holding a Rubik's Cube. I couldn't believe I thought he was blue. Mom, there's an oriental girl in our yard. Mom. I thought about telling him that I was at the wrong house, but decided to just head for the gate. It was too late, though. The nurse came out, dish towel over one shoulder. Tilting her head, she tried to remember me, tried to place me between good and evil. I think she's a street person, Mom. Alex, please. Well, she could be. Maybe she doesn't speak English, he said and shouted, are you homeless? In a strange way, I liked the way he was talking to me. He was so interested, like I was a science project he truly believed in. I didn't say a word, though, afraid I might break the spell. Maybe we should bring her in, he said. In the shower, I uncapped all the different shampoos the nurse owned and sniffed each and every one of them. One was called Monterey Mist, another Australian Kiwi. The smells made me hungry. I was getting ready to lather up the washcloth when a hand poked through the curtains. Here, she said, handing me a kitchen sponge. You can use this. I took it, held it flat in my hand, wondered if it was new or little used or if any of that mattered. The sponge made me think of something that had happened on a train a while back. A woman had sat staring up at me in a way I was sure was rude. She had dry hair and small bird eyes and was wearing a t-shirt that said number one Nana in glitter paint. I decided she was an unhappy person. But not knowing what to make of her really, I asked her if she wanted a page. She said nothing and kept staring. They're today's pages, I told her, and showed her one, but her eyes wouldn't blink. I wanted to snap her head off. You can't die from talking to me, I whispered to her. And as if someone had put coins into her slot, her face cringed. I was winning. She was going to speak. Her lips were going to move and she was going to talk to me as if I were a real person. And I was ready to prove to her that she wasn't better, just better off. You smell, she said. <clears throat> the nurse had put out a shirt, hospital pants, and mismatched socks on top of the toilet seat. Without drying off, I jumped into the clothes and wiped the steam off the mirror so I could see the new me. The hair was tangled and everything fit a little loose, but I wish Blue was there. In the kitchen, she stood over the stove, stirring ketchup into a pan of meat. Hi, I said from the other side of the counter. Christ, you scared me. I apologize. The light above her drew tired shadows on her face. I wanted to thank her right then, to tell her that no stranger had ever been this good to me. But then we both sort of looked away and the moment turned old. She pulled out a bottle, a bottle from the freezer and made herself a drink. Where's your kid? I asked. He's at the neighbor's. Oh. She took a sip and folded her arms. How was the shower? Good. That's good, she said. The shampoos were real nice. She rearranged a magnet on the fridge. Oh, you used those? Good. I'm glad. How's Blue Fly, I asked. Who? My boyfriend at the hospital. Oh, that's where I know you from. You're, what's his face? Walter's friend. 
I didn't think she deserved to know his real name. He's good, she said. At least when I left him, he was. On the side of the fridge hung a calendar of famous nurses. That month was Miss Dorothea Dix, a Civil War nurse. You know, my mom's a... I stopped talking because the woman dumped her drink into a blender and pushed a button and then another. Look, I'd ask you to stay for dinner, but I'm sorry, did you say something? That's okay. I'm actually not that hungry. I should get going, I said, opening the sliding glass door. Okay, how about some money? She looked around the kitchen. Do you want some money? From under the counter, she pulled out a yellow pages and opened it to a section stuffed with bills. Should I only have six dollars? I told her it was okay, that I didn't want any. What are you talking about? She put the six bucks on the counter between us, and I noticed that her hand was shaking. I'd give you more, but who the hell knows where my purse is, she said, her hand clutching a clump of her bangs. My whole life was in there. <clears throat> After I left the woman's house, I went to the hospital where my mother worked. From behind a bush, I watched cars pull up the circular driveway and carry the sick home. The cherry light on top of an ambulance spun in the dark and the hospital windows turned black one by one as I waited for almost an hour. It was close to midnight when my mom finally came. I only saw her a few seconds, killing the cigarette on the sidewalk, brushing something off her uniform before walking through the automatic doors and then down a green striped hallway. She hadn't changed much since I had left her almost three years ago. Her hair was still short, still blunt, still black. But maybe it was somebody else. It could have been. I don't know. <clears throat> Blue was asleep when I got home that night. I reached up and turned on the flashlight he'd rigged so it hung from the ceiling. The floor turned into a pale yellow egg, and the light made pretty everything it touched. An open can of ravioli, the bandage just below his knee, a green leather purse. He'd fallen asleep in his underwear, the gear still in his arm. I knelt down and pulled it out as slowly as I could, but it wasn't easy. His skin and pus had dried around the needle. I knew he'd come back, he said with a sleepy smile. I loved him so much then. Anything left for me? I asked. He pushed himself up slowly and kissed me on the lips. Yeah, he said. And I leaned back against the wall, feeling my new clean body sink through the plaster as he rolled up my sleeve and placed his arm under mine. That all right? He asked, tightening the belt finding the right notch, flicking the needle, then smoothing the skin on my arm up and down, always so good at tracing my wire, always so good at taking me home. I closed my eyes and thought about the mother and the son and the tree and the train and how one day could expand into a lifetime, then shrink again into one single moment. Ready? Blue asked and pushed before I could answer. Thank you. When I, get, when I get nervous, I get really, really hot. Like I just start, I shouldn't be wearing polyester. That's probably a big mistake. But um, thank you so much for coming out. I am here to answer any and all questions you might have. Um, I know it's a little awkward to ask questions to a stranger, so I'll give you some subject topics if you want. Uh, you can ask me questions about the book, of course, about writing, if there are any writers out there, um, about my tour. This is my first tour ever, so I've definitely experienced a lot of crazy things. Um, any, any questions? or? Oh, about my tour? Okay, well, I'll tell you this one thing. Okay, so um, this was, okay, I think this, this has to be the craziest thing of them all. 
I'm pretty sure, yeah. Okay. Um, my f flight from, I live in Chicago, and this is my first day. It's a 14 uh, city tour, and this was my first city, which was to Portland. I was really excited. This is my first book, you know, I'm a total newbie. I'm so excited. I got on the plane, so it was from Chicago to Portland. And everything was going fine, you know. I was kind of anxious, but you know, it's still good. And then um, the captain comes on the loudspeaker. Um, and you know how sometimes captain voices are really sexy? They have like that sexy captain, you know, like slinky kind of voice. Um, he just came on like, he almost like whispered into my ear or something. He said, ladies and gentlemen, we're on our final descent to Portland. Uh, we'll be touching ground in about 20 to 25 minutes. So if you wanted to stretch your legs or use the facilities, this is a great time to do it. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, I don't even have to pee. But he said it so nicely. I just thought, well, well, maybe I should, I mean, he, he was so suggestive the way he said it. It's like, like my bladder got intrigued or something. And I was just like, I was like, oh, well, okay. Well, you know, sure. You know, I got up, other people got up and, you know, I, I walked to the back, you know, in the back alley. It's really narrow there, you know, the, like the walls here and then the bathrooms here and you push the bathroom door to get in. So I went in there, you know, I was in there maybe 30 seconds tops. I'm very quick in there, you know. And I came out, and thank God I came out, because as soon as I stepped out onto the galley, the plane just dropped. I mean, I mean, I was in the air. I was at my, both my feet were in the air, and I actually could feel like being in the air, and I was doing like this weird matrix move, and, you know. <laughs> and it just dropped, and then I slammed into the wall, hit my head, dropped to the floor, and then the plane dropped again, made this huge sound, it's, you know, terrifying sound, and then I was up in the air again, uh, and then I f fell down again. That, believe it or not, was not the, the scary part. The scary part was the stewardesses, who are usually very calm, and they talk in that really calm voice, you know, tea, coffee, you know, they were screaming at the top of their lungs, and they were. And one was screaming, "Everybody get down! Everybody get down!" And that freaked me out more than anything, just to see this person who's supposed to be kind of calm, uh, screaming. And I, you know, and she was, and I'm just sort of flopping around. And other people are back there. And they're everyone. They're on the floor. The stewardesses are on the floor. Everyone's on the floor. Um, computers are flying. Uh, books, coats, you know, everything. And then uh, we're just, I'm just barely hanging on. I'm sort of, you know, on the ground, sort of uh, clutching onto things. And then the captain calls, or the phone rings. And it's like dead silent. Everyone's just like super uh, frightened. Um, the plane is just jumping around. And the phone goes, Bring! and you can hear it because everyone is so quiet. And then the stewardesses weren't answering the phone. And I was thinking, like, somebody should get that because that's the captain calling. That might be some really important information. The phone keeps ringing, and one stewardess says to the other, aren't you going to get that? And the other one's like, I, I, you know, I'm going to hurt myself if I try and get up. You know? And then, well, yeah, but, but you really should get that. And they were kind of arguing back and forth, which was kind of weird to watch. You know, like, I think you should get that. You know. So finally, she kind of like, oh, sort of reaches over and, you know, finally reaches the phone. And she kind of hear, she kind of yells, chews out the captain, which I thought was kind of funny. She um, said something like, what's going on up there? We're being tossed around back here. I was like, oh. And then she just gets really quiet and she goes, uh-huh. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then she just drops the phone and the plane's still shaking. And then finally it evens out. The phone's like dangling. And then, um, you know, we think it's sort of leveled out a little bit. And this is the funniest part. She, she comes, use, using her stewardess voice again, she says, this might be a good time to run back to your seats. And I thought, <laughs> She actually said run, which was like, like it's kind of funny, but she was trying to keep it all contained, everything's okay, you know. And then so we're all like just running back to our seats. I sit down and put on my seatbelt. We land, everything is fine. But the captain, 
you know how usually when you hit some turbulence, the captain comes on and says, you know, sorry about that, folks. We hit a little turbulence. He never came back on the air. No explanation of what happened. And when we were leaving, usually the captain, the cockpit door is open, and they usually say, thanks for flying with us. The door was completely shut, and the stewardesses were acting like nothing. You know, goodbye, goodbye. Well, one stewardess came up to me. And she said, you know, I think we should file a report because, uh, you know, I saw you getting tossed around. I saw you, you know, hitting your head. So we should, you know, probably do that. And, and the, the, the EMT was there waiting for me when I landed. And I was trying, I was thinking, okay, this is my first book tour. I'm so excited. I do not want to go to the hospital. I, I haven't even seen my hotel room yet. You know, that's supposed to be like the, I want to see my hotel room and see how fancy it is and stuff. So um, the EMT came up and I said, oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm OK. I'm really OK. I'm, I'm a little vomitous. But I'm okay. Like I was, I was really sort of a little kind of nauseous. So I left them. I walked forward, and then I was, realized I had to talk to the supervisor to file a report. And then we I came back, and then we were walking to his office. And then suddenly, like the entire airport just started spinning. It's like oh, and my knees just kind of buckled. So anyway, it's it's been a good tour. <laughs> It's been, it's been exciting. I'm okay now. It turned out I suffered a slight concussion, but it's like you know I didn't I couldn't sleep for 12 hours and stuff like that. But I kept on with my tour. Um, I read through an earthquake in Los Angeles, which was really interesting. And uh, as I was reading, uh, the Earth was moving, but then I thought it was the vertigo that I had experienced from the plane incident. So I thought I was shaking, and so I I just kept on reading. And then I realized, oh, no, 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 the, everyone's shaking. Like, this is, this is an earthquake. But I just kept reading anyway. And they thought I was <laughs> kind of funny for doing that. But yeah, I guess that's the most uh, interesting thing that's happened so far. Wow, where did you guys come from? <laughs> Any other questions about my book? Or? So what airline was that? Uh, <laughs> I think since we're on video, I probably shouldn't say. Um, Although I did get a call from them, and I'm, I'm expecting free airline tickets. You know? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. But I probably shouldn't say who they are. But I, I mean, and then I saw that airplane uh, crash where everyone survived in New York, and I was just like, oh my god, I can't get back on the plane. <laughs> it's so scary. But two more cities to go, and then I'm done with my tour. So you guys caught me on the last, sort of last three legs here. Any other questions? Come on, you guys must have some questions. Have you thought about a second? Yeah. I have two projects that I'm working on right now. Um, I can tell one is already taking the back seat because I'm not talking about it. I keep on talking about this other one, which is a, I used to be a criminal defense investigator. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah, OK. Um, <clears throat> and I've always been interested in criminology and just sort of not just the actual uh, unfairness of our ju justice system, but the emotions that are involved in someone committing a crime and how it affects everyone else around them. Um, so it's a short story collection about one crime. And it's not a thriller. It's more of a, a, a book about like emotional culpability as a society. Wow, that, was, that sounded kind of big, didn't it? That sounded serious. It'll be funny. No. <laughs> it's a comedy. Yeah. Did you offer that experience? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the question, so did I draw from my criminal defense yeah, investigation? Were you all this uh, crack house uh, description of Does it come from Chicago? Does it come from your mind? Um, God, I, I would hope that my heart and my mind are kind of in sync and then it's sort of coming out this way. I mean, definitely, this book is, uh, I mean, I myself was a runaway, um, but people often ask me, you know, is this autobiographical? And the answer is, I'm going to say it on tape, you're right, it's only 1% autobiographical in the sense that the premise of the book reflects, you know, some of my experience. You know, I left home for good at 13. But the actual events that occur in this book are completely fictional. I mean, I went to school for fiction writing, you know, um, and I really like, um, 
I like getting at the truth in a more indirect way, you know. I like getting at the truth by, you know, describing the weather or the light or, you know, your beautiful skin or, you know, just other, other modes of getting at the truth instead of a, a more direct way, which I think, you know, is what a memoir uh, would, you know, would they often do that. Um, not that I have anything against memoirs, but I just never considered it uh, for this book. Um, but for my next book, definitely the criminal defense investigations experience will come into play. Um, I think, I, you know, one of the things that I learned from doing that job is, um, you know, I would interview people, the defendants, who can't afford an attorney, and so once you know, hired, once given to them, and then you know, I would do some investigations for the, for that uh, defend, for the defendant. I was a court-appointed investigator. Anyway, um, one thing that I learned from speaking with all of these different characters, different people, is that they're judged by this one act that they've committed. And you know, can you imagine, like, if we were all just judged by one act? I mean, it would just, um, it would be kind of horrifying for us. But I learned that they, I mean, don't get me wrong, what they commit is sometimes a very heinous uh, act. But I learned very quickly that there had been so many things that had been done unto them before they committed this act, that there's like this accumulative process, emotionally, um, and social, you know, there's this huge wave that, that culminates into this one act. So I kind of wanted to explore a little bit more about, um, not just the crime, but everything that goes in beforehand and, and then after, the aftermath of the crime. Does that make sense? Does that sound interesting? Yes. Okay, all right. I'll keep working on it. I'll keep working on it. Any other, any writers in here? No one likes to admit. Everyone goes like this. It's like, come on, there you go, there you go. Do you, are you working on a book or anything like that? I am. Okay. I magazines. Oh, okay. I just, uh, I sent out a book to the agents. Woo! If you have questions about publishing, I'm here. I mean, many people have helped me to get to this point, and I'm more than happy to help any, you know. Tell the story about how you got an agent. Oh, sure. That's, a, that's yeah. half the battle, Yeah, that is half the battle. Um, agents are, the well, one thing you have to remember is that you're hiring them. Right. That's number one. It, you know, I'm very, I'm a, I know it sounds weird because I'm standing here in front of you, but I'm actually a very insecure person. And so I tend to think that, oh, nobody's going to want my book, nobody's going to want me, that kind of stuff. Um, but I had to really rethink that. Um, and so I was doing a reading. At, a, at my grad school at Michigan, and an author happened to be in the reading. At the reading, he recommended me to his agent. She contacted me. I sent her some stories. I, and she said, "I want to work with you." And I could have said yes right then, but I chose not to because I had heard that, um, and somebody had given me the good advice, which is that you should really shop for agents. So when my book was done, 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 I, di I did not give her the entire book. I only gave her two stories, two chapters. When my book was 98.9% .9 done, and I really, you know, I would have give that advice to uh, just wait till it's absolutely done. As if, like, if it had been printed right then, or, you know, then and there, you'd be happy with it. Um, so I picked four agents. Narrowed it down to two. I interviewed them all. I liked them all, but I narrowed it down to two. And then I, being a very anal and analytical person, I had a spreadsheet um, that had 20 questions. And then basically, um, I would check off like who won that question, like who has more literary integrity. That person would get it. Who is known for selling, you know, novel and stories or episodic novels? You know, who's good with debut author? Blah blah blah. Who's more well known in the industry? I did that. It came out as a tie. <laughs> that didn't help. So I gave the same spreadsheet to my best friend and my boyfriend, Gus. Um, and they had to do the spreadsheet as well. They needed to do their research and then do the spreadsheet. 
that came back as a tie. One person for one person, one person for the other person. So I made them go back and do it again. And then one keeled over, yeah, switched over, and that's the person I ended up going. No, it was the other person. And funnily enough, it was the same first person uh, that, I, that was introduced to me earlier on. But I needed to do the due diligence. With anything, you got you to do the homework. And when I made that decision, it was an you know, educated, well thought out decision. She was the person for me. And you know, you know what I mean? Instead of thinking like, oh, she's the only one who wants me. I should go with her kind of thing. So it's a little bit more empowerment. But now getting an editor, that's a whole different story. But <laughs> Any other questions? No, that's it. Uncle Diddy, you have anything? I mean, did you write this as a series of short stories originally? Yeah, actually, that's a good question. Good question. Um, this is Uncle Denny, by the way. This is my boyfriend's uncle, and then his wife's is my aunt. I, we look alike, I know. Yeah, I, I, you can tell. Um, I wrote the first story that I wrote was actually uh, Club Orchid, which is a chapter in this book. I wrote it as a self-contained piece. Um, and then I wrote another story and another one, and I realized, okay, something's going on here. I knew I was onto something because my workshop group, my friends, you know, about 20 or so writers, the first story that I turned in way before I started my book, they just tore me a new one. They ripped me to shreds. They were so mean and evil. And, but it was good for me, you know, because I actually didn't turn in anything else for another year and a half. And I really worked on my craft a little bit. And then I turned in Club Orchid. And I knew I was on to something because they were arguing. But they were arguing in a way that, um, that indicated that they, they talked about her as June as if she were a real person. They would say things like, June would never say that. No, I don't think so. No, you guys are wrong. She would never do this, blah, blah, blah. And they were, they were just arguing. And I, I was like, wait, I, you know, I think I'm on to something here. Why would they argue about a character, right? So I wrote three, two more stories, so all self-contained. And then I realized you know, they could actually be cogs working toward a larger narrative. I like the short story format. But I also like the fact that it would have a larger narrative about this runaway. Um, and once I began to think of it as a book, I started doing away with labels, short stories, chapter. I, now I just call it everything, short stories, chapter, novel, novel and stories. I, mean, I think my favorite label is episodic novel. But it's been called so many things. I just like to think of it as a hybrid. Um, but of course, they put novel there because that's what sells. So I have, I, have no, I have no say over these kinds of things. But yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, can you describe the, some of the challenges and some of the um, highlights of being a Korean American? Oh, OK. That's, actually, I've never been asked that. OK, some of the challenges. Let's see. Well, I have to be really honest with you. I didn't really, when I was writing the book, I didn't really sense any challenges because I just, I think I have sort of, um, I just sort of keep my head down and I write. And I, I, I didn't really pop my head back up until eight years later. It took me eight years to write this. Um, I would send stories out, but I just didn't really think about the Korean American part of me that much. Um, that said, when the book came out, you know, book's been out now and I've been doing interviews and stuff, I get asked a lot of questions about like Korean American identity, Korean American, uh, you know, as a culture in the States, immigrant, you know. And so my answer to that, to those questions is that this book is not uh, a community portrait of K Korean Americans in 1980s Bronx. That's what it's not. It's not about Korean American identity per se, um, and it's not even necessary. I mean, it is about a teenage runaway, but I like to think of the book as more like a book about um, alienation and and isolation and feeling disconnected from society. And I think those feelings uh, can inf infiltrate you know, any anyone no matter their country of origin, whether you're a construction worker or a runaway or a sex worker or a housewife, it doesn't really matter. So I like to think of the book as 
more about that than about being Korean American. But one of the challenges is I get the, you know, not, not, not that you asked that question, but, you know, I get those questions and, you know, think, you know, what do you think this book is saying about Korean Americans? And I'm like, well, I, you know, you'd have to ask, some, you know, a reader, because I have obviously a very specific perspective on my book. Um, I keep on holding it up like it's my child. Um, <laughs> But I also feel this liberation, you know, this is a great time for Asian American writers. I feel that people, writers, great writers in the past have already written amazing books about identity, about cross-cultural, you know, issues and about, you know, having bicultural, you know, childhoods. They've done such a great job. I don't feel the obligation to do that anymore to tell that story anymore. I feel really liberated. Um, and I think it's just a really wonderful time right now. And hopefully, after tomorrow, it'll be even more wonderful after the inauguration. But that is a good question. Yeah. So are you a writer yourself? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> Any other questions? Would it have mattered whether it came from a Korean American as good writing, good writing, good writing? Would it have mattered? No, just from that perspective. I mean, for me, as a reader, I definitely, I mean, I don't look at, like, if the sentence is bad, I'm not going to read it. And I don't even care about the plot. I'm more of a language person, so I don't care if it has this amazing gripping plot. If my, if the first page doesn't include, like, at least ten sentences that I really love, I'm not going to read that book. And that's, you know, that's, I'm not saying that my book is like that, but I'm saying that's the kind of, um, focus I had with my book is that I was first was language like the language has to be good you know and then very close second was character you know and June is like someone who's very close to me and I had to be true to her and one of the actually this is actually coming back to your question I made a crucial decision a long time ago when I saw this as a book, to keep the episodic nature of this book. I felt like it would have been a betrayal to her to have this sort of fluid um, novel. And really, I thought the, the, the episodic nature sort of better portrayed her fractured mindset and the, the jagged life that she leads. I wanted the reader to have that sort of jagged stop and start experience, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm all about visceral experiences. <laughs> come clean here and say, wait, maybe, wait, is this going on YouTube? No. <laughs> no, um, I, I mean, a lot of it, I'll start off by saying a lot of it, I did a lot of research, and that meant, meant reading a lot of essays, letters from teenagers, um, uh, documentaries, a really good documentary that everyone should watch is called um, Children Underground. It's about these kids who live in subways in Bucharest and the age range is like from eight is eight year old is the youngest one to like a 16 year old it is so heartbreaking um, I've seen it five times and I cry every single time I can't stop myself um, dark days which is also about uh, homeless folks who live in this New York subways um, streetwise there are many great documentaries. I have that, and then I have my criminal defense investigation years, you know, where I definitely have met a variety of characters, you know. Um, and heroin addicts, to be honest, were the kindest of all the drug addicts that I, I've had to come in contact with. They're usually very mellow, you know. Um, but during my runaway years, I did, you know, spend some time in living in what they call, what you might call a commune or drug dens or however, whatever you want to put on it. And there, you know, there were a lot of heroin addicts around me. I myself, uh, luckily, did not partake in that activity, but I was surrounded by a lot of, and there were um, functioning addicts. They all had jobs. They were, you know, it was, they were very regular about their addiction. So I don't want you to think that all heroin addicts are 
they're all different kinds of addicts. Did that answer your question? So hopefully, from all of those things, I got it right. <laughs> What? Eight years. Eight years for 215 manuscript pages. Does anyone have a calculator? How much is that? How many pages is that a year? That makes me the slowest writer I know of. Um, I think Juno Diaz took 10 years, but his book is much longer. So I don't know. Because it explains the phraseology, which is exquisite. Oh, thank you. What's exquisite? The phraseology. Oh. I, uh, I love the way you describe things. Oh. Words together for descriptions. I tell my students, you have to try and look for words that are magnetically attracted to each other. Just try and keep on trying out new words, you know. But I definitely, thank you for saying that. That means a lot to me because I definitely, you know, I can spend like eight to ten hours writing. And if I have a good, a, a paragraph, I'm ecstatic. And I, I have no problems working on a paragraph. For it's beautiful. It's like a roller coaster. They're my family. They're, don't listen to them. <laughs> Let's hear from a stranger. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, if they hadn't read it, they should. Thank you so much for coming out, you guys. Really, Can thank you. Some? Yeah, sure. What, what writers do you read and which one specifically influences this book? Oh, okay. Good questions. The first question I'm going to answer, you know, my students asked me, I teach, I'm a professor of creative writing, and they asked me uh, to, um, I'm sorry, okay, I'm going on too long. They asked me to uh, give them my top ten list. They love lists. Students love top ten lists of my favorite authors. I, I, I'm right now up to number 67. So I'm really terrible at answering that question. That said, um, the book that came into my mind, uh, as you said, it was uh, Bruno Schultz. I don't know if you've ever read *The Street of Crocodiles. He's a Polish writer. He's long passed away. His sentences, oh my god. It's like there's a tiny movie inside each sentence. The metaphors are just so cinematic and and just the word choices and the verb choices. It, it, it's, you know, it's definitely um, really exciting for me. And he writes completely different uh, from you know, my style, but I, I love, I appreciate his style. Um, but for this book, definitely uh, Hubert Selby Jr., Last Exit to Brooklyn, that, that book changed my life in the sense that I finished that book pretty much in one sitting. And it's a, it's a book about 1960s Brooklyn. It's just, all the characters are downward spiraling and they're just, they just want like their little moment of grace and they can't seem to quite get it, but they try, you know. Um, but after I finished that book, I realized, oh, I can't go back to the way I used to write before. And that book just completely liberated me to write about the street, you know, like alleys and, and, and street kids and, you know, I felt like, oh, I didn't realize that that could be literature, you know. I thought, as Richard Price says, um, in his, when he talks about his writing sort of a career, he said he thought that he had to be a, a dead white man, uh, a dead a dead man to be a writer, to be a writer or something like that. And I, I rephrase it by saying I thought I had to be a dead white man to be a writer. But that book just completely woke me up. Have you read it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know what I'm talking yeah. about, right? This is all Requiem for a Dream. Requiem for a Dream. Oh. oh. His book is short story, Song in the Silence. Song in the Silence. No. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I mean, he's, I don't know, he's, he's, he's known by writers. I'm not sure how well he's known outside of writers, but it's definitely, it's a tough read. And, and, and I'll admit that my book is a tough read as well, but you got to stick with it. Get to the end. Okay, I think that's it. Yes, thank you so much for coming out.